Okay. Thank you for joining us for the webinar today. And for those of you who are watching at a later time, um, the subject matter today is the ideal office manager. We want to take a little bit of time to break down this position and go over uh, what it's made up of and the benefits that it can be for practice and talk about some of the specifics to give an office manager a positive experience in running this position excuse me, this important position for a practice. So we'll start with going over um, how the presentation will work today. This is gonna be a flyover of the office manager position. We're not gonna necessarily get involved with all of the ways that you perform each of the functions that we discussed today. It's more of an overview of the composite parts of the office manager position. So we'll start with some of the commonly held misconceptions about what an office manager is. Um, we work with practices all over the country and have for many, many years, and we find that this is an important point to take up. Um, oftentimes, the office manager is the person who runs the front office, or the person who has been there the longest, or the person who handles the finances for the practice, or the person who's kind of the go-to to place an ad when you're hiring somebody. Um, contrary to that, the office manager is a fully functioning executive position in a practice, and even in a small practice with relatively few team members, it's important to identify the parts of the office manager position and to allocate enough time for the person responsible for that to do those functions throughout every week, every month, every quarter, every year, and make sure that we're paying enough attention to these parts of the practice. So. Let's look at a truer picture of the office manager position. Um, we have various parts of the practice. Obviously, there's a department that's dedicated to treatment. We have a department that's dedicated to the administrative uh, parts of patient care, that being the patient schedule, the patient charting, things like that. We have a finance department that's dedicated to handling the money of the patients and practice. We have an HR component where we bring on our staff and take care of them, uh, keep them performing well, and then we have some sort of a marketing and or PR part of the practice. So just identifying those different departments and activities within a practice, it starts to give us the idea that an office manager's work is pointed at taking care of the practice first, making sure that all the parts are represented, making sure that time is devoted to each of those uh, parts of a practice, and also taking a look at what the ideal is for each of those departments. Now, this can be misunderstood and it can be an unpopular opinion to take uh, care of the practice first. Most people are oriented to taking care of the patients, taking care of the staff, and that's absolutely true. The idea that we're going over here today is that if you take care of the practice and you install the appropriate systems and the appropriate oversight, that is how you take care of the staff, and that is how you take care of the doctors, the patients, etc. So when you're looking for an office manager, you're looking for someone who is quite heavy on these skills that we're overviewing here. Um, communication is at the forefront of everything. It has to do with how you interact with staff, patients, doctors, the community, etc. This needs to be someone who has leadership skills in that um, you're not necessarily being a part of the group, you are leading the group. And of course, that is a part of the group, but the group itself needs leadership. They're very much in a day-to-day -day flow of work, and they need someone who's looking out over the front of the ship and seeing where you're going and keeping them all working well. Um, when it comes to operations, you do take a lot of patients and put them through the, the flow of your office. And in doing so, you need to make sure that the wheels are turning appropriately. If we only rely on the workflow and the workload of your staff, that can be quite exhausting and repetitive for a practice. If you use the proper systems and you use the proper oversight of systems in your practice, it reduces the workload and it improves the efficiency for the practice overall. So as we take a look at this part of things, what we want to do is make sure that what's represented here is the bigger picture. This isn't the office manager position. Certainly the office manager needs to 
um, have the day-to-day -day operations in mind, but we're looking at someone who's got kind of a bigger view and not just how we're going to handle today, but how we're going to handle the coming years of this practice experience. So how do we do this? Um, it's important for the office manager and the owner doctor to align on the mission statement or the vision statement for the practice. It sounds like a very simple step, but it's an important one. Um, if we say why we're here and what we care about, what we're trying to do, then we can start getting into managing the expectations of that mission and saying, well, who's in charge of that? Who's going to watch it? Who's going to talk about when we're moving away from that mission or when we're not meeting our own expectations? It leads pretty quickly into a general assessment of the practice where you're looking at your strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats that you're faced with in achieving your goals. Um, goals are different for every practice. Some people want to maintain a particular volume or a particular set of services that they're providing and others want to expand. So taking a look at what your plans are in specific for how you're going to maintain the quality and the standards of your vision, um, get it done on a daily but also an overall basis, and then assess what's in your way and what's contributing to your success this is a big part of how the owner and the office manager cooperate together. So the next part of being an office manager, of course, has to do with your team. So we start with how do you know when you need staff? What is your allocation process so that you can determine how many staff members you need in which position, um, the idea of the finances behind that, can you afford all of the staff that you need? As you're adding staff, it should be increasing your productivity so that that ratio remains in check. But now, once you've done the proper assessment, you can see that there's quite a bit just to the subject of hiring the proper staff, onboarding them properly with all the legal parameters covered, and then beginning a training program with your staff. Um, practices are notoriously light on the training side of things. It's a very difficult subject for a practice. You almost always have patients present either in the treatment area, the waiting room, or on the phone. There's very little that happens in private in a practice. So you are forced into an on-the-job training model, which is based mostly on observation. Uh, you're watching somebody else do a task, and therein you're supposed to absorb the data of how you do the task, that kind of thing. And it works to a certain degree. But it is very difficult because it ends up with a situation where new team members are exposed to everything all at once. They don't necessarily get a chance to take one piece of the job at a time and become proficient at that and build on it and move on to it. So that's a, that's a difficult thing. We work with practices a lot on creating a training system and running a new employee through a set of training. Um, but moving forward from there, there's a whole piece of the office manager position that just has to do with communication. Um, how do you communicate with your staff on an ongoing basis? It's difficult and it's often improperly assessed how much of this is required. Again, you'll say, well, I'm with these people all day. There's nobody who's missing being in communication with each other or staying in touch, so to speak. But when we do an assessment of this, we find that there is a lot of communication that is missed or not quite as specific as it needs to be or doesn't happen as regularly as it should in a practice and that becomes a problem. So this ties in pretty closely with oversight of the performance of the different positions. Um, this is not a corporation. You do have maybe a number of assistants and perhaps a hygienist in a general practice and a clinic team, and then you've got a front office team. Um, but looking at performance is more than just looking at the person. We do work with practices on individual performance reviews, and that's an important part of the HR. Uh, segment of your practice, but it's not the only thing that's involved. We do have to take a look at overall practice efficiency and see how well our systems are working. So one of the things that we use um, to enhance this performance and the communication processes are the proper meetings that you're supposed to have in a practice. Um, we are not here to have meetings. We're here to take care of patients. And a lot of people have meeting aversion, and I understand that completely. Um, but if you put in place the proper proactive meetings, 
then it gives you an opportunity to move away from crisis management and take a bigger look at the parts of the practice and how to optimize them and run them standardly. Um, most practices have some of these meetings in place and they don't have others. Some of them have these meetings in place, but they're ineffective. So we always like to take a look at which meetings a practice is using and which ones they should be using. A huddle is obviously a right now type of meeting, how we're gonna address the day. Our staff meetings are oriented a little bit more to announcements and training and progress of the practice and the campaigns or programs we might be running. A look ahead meeting is aimed at looking at the patient schedule, not today for the huddle, but in bigger bites of weeks at a time so that we can look at a scheduling model, see if we're sticking to it, are we running on time, how are we handling our patient flow, and then your management meeting is designed for you to look at statistics and performance with a doctor, owner, and a manager and keep the overall presence and progress of the practice moving forward. So the meetings are an important part of things. Um, we also have, as we move on to the next section, you know, how are we going to handle the, um, with our existing staff, how are we going to handle the situations that we often find ourselves faced with? Things like dismissing staff, uh, capacity, when is it time to add new staff, uh, transferring somebody from one area to another, perhaps in the case of a promotion. And then we get into this hierarchy of discipline. Um, this is a difficult subject because you've got staff who are trying to perform. Uh, sometimes they're not meeting performance standards. So what do you do about that? Well, I'm actually going to lead that into the next section that we want to discuss today, which is keeping a library. Um, the practices that we work with go through a process of optimizing these documents. They have an HR manual or an employee manual for the practice, a handbook, if you will. Uh, we provide a set of job descriptions. We provide a set of policies. Those are editable and in template form for the practices that we work with, but everybody needs to have these. Um, we also work with practices on their protocols, the how-to of different tasks within the practice. Now, let's say that you had all of these documents. That's great. You could file them away and check that off your list and say that you have them. But for the office manager position, the implementation, the ongoing use, the uh, bringing these documents to life and keeping them alive as a living, breathing part of the practice is everything. Uh, the use of the documents comes into play when you're doing performance reviews, when you're training people, when you're correcting people, when you're looking at the performance of the practice and you're deciding where certain functions need to be improved or simply delegated to a certain part of the practice. So creating and maintaining your library is one thing, but using your library and getting your staff using your library for when they run into bottlenecks or inefficiencies or when something's going really well and they need to document that so that they can share their positive experience with this part of the practice with others who might be in the position um, or who might intersect with that position. It, it can't be viewed just as a negative. This has to be looked at when things are going right. We want to standardize everybody's view of that and get people doing things in the same way as much as possible. So after the library, we want to take a look at the diagnostics. What do you get involved with as far as evaluating your practice? Um, the analysis point usually starts with the statistics that you keep. Uh, we find that practices have, through their practice management software and perhaps their accounting systems, no end of reports that they can run. Um, oftentimes, people will run those reports, take a look at them, file them away, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's kind of where things stand. On the contrary, we like to help build uh, statistical oversight mechanisms for the practices where in very simple fashion, you're able to take a look at the different parts of the practice, how well they're producing, how well it compares to other time periods of high or low production in your practice, and then go through a pretty standard evaluation process. Um, this leads you into strategy and gives you an opportunity to use what you're seeing in the trends of your statistics to decide what you're going to do moving forward. Perhaps you need to get involved in some corrective action. Um, perhaps you have something that slipped through the cracks and is no longer being maintained as a system in your practice. Or some practices have something that's going very, very, very well and they want to take actions to reinforce that. So let's say you do that. 
you keep your statistics, you evaluate them, and you make a strategy. Well, now that you've done that, it needs to be coupled with an impact analysis, taking a look at when you took those actions, what impact did it have on the performance of the practice? What about staff morale? What about patient engagement? If you're evaluating things properly and taking appropriate steps, you should be able to see the positive impacts that are taking place. It also gives you an opportunity to roll back or reverse any changes that you've made that are improper for the practice. And of course, there is always an experiment uh, involved with implementing something new. You do have to watch it. This is very much the territory of the office manager to decide what to implement or change, to watch the impact of the change, change and then to reinforce or reverse changes that have been made so you can keep things moving forward in the practice. So the next major portion of the practice that we want to talk about is scheduling. You know, the schedule is the brain of everything that takes place in the practice. So again, we can look at today's schedule and see how well it is designed, see if we're running on time according to that schedule, but there's kind of a a bigger model in play here. First of all, have you developed an ideal schedule? Do you have a template for scheduling in your practice? Does it represent having enough of each treatment type represented? Uh, is it a schedule that represents the level of productivity that you wanna see on a daily basis? Have you made your staff scheduling match up with your practice scheduling match up with your patient scheduling? Um, this is the type of thing that requires quite a bit of monitoring, actually. Um, we touched briefly on the look ahead meetings, um, but somebody needs to be in charge of this schedule. We can't just have only the scheduler in the practice be in charge of it. Somebody needs to be monitoring things like the patient flow, the on-time rate of the practice. And again, that sounds very formal and corporate. It's actually quite simple. The biggest part of it is just getting it done and getting it done routinely and having an oversight mechanism. Um, in the end, we know that we're always going to have issues with the schedule. The schedule is prone to things like your patients canceling or no-showing, things like emergencies coming up. So when you take a big bird's eye view of the subject of scheduling for a practice, one of the great things that you have an opportunity to do is to make some standard approaches that you want to have in place for when you do have scheduling issues. Um, that is very helpful to the front office staff and keeps everything from having to be reinvented every single day with either the doctor or the manager. Well, now we have this situation, what do we do? Now we have that situation, what do we do? Um, the proper oversight of scheduling also allows for an evaluation point on when you need to add capacity to your schedule. Do you need another hygienist or a provider in the practice? And taking a look at how far out you're scheduling, what the data supports, um, how you're gonna make that financially viable, things like that. So scheduling is obviously a huge subject in the practice. We wanna make sure that it has some oversight on the part of the office manager. Um, and that leads basically into our next portion here, which is we wanna talk about the finances. Um, these, we're gonna focus right now on the patient side of things. How do you determine what your fees are going to be? How often do you evaluate the fees for your practice? And this is not just playing defense and saying, oh, well, we have to do this and we have to do that and we've always done this and we want to do that. This is really taking a look at what the ideal is as far as viability for your practice, um, doing a comparative analysis of other practices in the area, some national averages, and then finding your place as far as where your overall patient fees will fall. Um, it moves very quickly into the idea of insurance participation, which plans do you want to participate with and to what level. Um, there is a mechanism in most practices for instant insurance verification so that a patient knows not only what insurance coverage they have, but how much of that they've used. So you can interact with them on treatment planning and give them an accurate picture of what they can expect as far as coverage for their insurance. Um, the treatment presentation, are we going to standardize for every patient who comes through the office the way that treatment is presented? And, you know, this is a huge subject. We take a look at case presentation, treatment plan presentation, and a practice because without you having to get a bunch more new patients coming into the practice in order to expand, if you simply take the patients that you're already getting, 
get them to engage with and accept more of the treatment that you're presenting, you've got a different situation in terms of viability. And then on top of that, you can market and increase your patient flow. But treatment presentation is one subject that we go to uh, in a practice. It's got its own tracking system. In some cases, it's got its own personnel. This is very much a part of the kind of thing that an office manager needs to implement and oversee and uh, train and that kind of thing. So again, once we're in the territory of presenting treatment, we need to make sure that our systems are all optimized for your patient financial policies, all of your billing and collection processes, and then accounts receivable as well. Um, most practices age account receivables. Um, they do so on the insurance side more so than on the patient side. We've got some great tracking for patient aging, insurance aging, total aging, but also instead of, like we mentioned earlier, just looking at that report and filing it away, we do some trend management on this and do some comparison month to month to month to month to see the trend of what your um, accounts receivable is doing and how you can influence it. So this is a huge part of oversight on the part of an office manager. Again, it's not so much the patient who's right in front of you and what you're going to do with that person, but how are you going to set things up for success in the practice as it relates to the patient financial side of things. Uh, that moves us into the practice financial side of things. Um, there is another part of financial management that has to do with a practice itself and watching for the viability of the practice. So we mentioned earlier the statistics that you're going to be keeping. Um, it's important that you understand that statistics are great, they're vital, everybody needs them. But if your statistics go from $5 to $10, it's a nice upward trend, but it's not necessarily a matter of moving you into viability. Is that the amount of production that you need to be supporting in the practice? So we help to do some comparative monitoring when it comes to your statistics, and this is done in light of your financial viability. We can do a P&L analysis for you. We can take a look at the benchmarks in the industry of where your cost ratio should fall, and then help you to do the monitoring of your, st of your statistics in light of the viability of the practice. Um, this pretty quickly gets into the accounting and the bookkeeping part of the practice. Some practices keep this in-house, some practices keep this with the doctor or the manager, others hire a bookkeeper, an accounting agency to outsource some of this. There are advantages to both. Um, if you're going to use an outsourcing mechanism or if the office manager is going to handle some of these things, there needs to be a clear definition of how frequently you're going to take a look at the reporting and, <clears throat> excuse me, how the coordination of the evaluation of these reports is going to be drawn out between an owner and a manager and or a bookkeeper. <clears throat> this will also show us that there are times where you have to make changes to your accounting processes or to your systems within the practice. Proper oversight of this area shows you that something is going well or it isn't. It shows you that something is viable or it isn't, and it helps you to make faster changes that will be a benefit to the practice or avoid deficiencies in the practice on the financial side of things. So having a finger on the pulse of the practice financials, it's a huge part of the office manager position and one that is underrepresented. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear somebody who is not a full-fledged or fully functioning office manager say, oh yeah, I caught everything up, I got all my entry done, and you know, the letters this and that kind of thing. It's, it's not like that. The ideal office manager is taking a bigger look at the practice financials. Um, so the next part of the practice that we want to take a look at is gap management. There are gaps in a practice. There are things that fall through the cracks and it is important for somebody to be taking a look using a tremendous amount of logic and objectivity at when that is occurring. Um, a general practice will tell you that one of the main manifestations of this is in the recall system. Um, you will have a number of patients who are in your maintenance program but not necessarily scheduled for a recall appointment. Um, even at best, when you have a high percentage of those people participating in maintenance care, you will still have a mechanism for somebody falling off the schedule right in that moment and not getting rescheduled and therefore they fall through the cracks. Um, even if we're not talking about a hygiene program, 
in every practice, there are patients with whom you have diagnosed but not completed treatment. In that way, we need to make sure that we have proper reporting of those patients who have outstanding treatment and what your communication with them is going to be. Um, some people tie this to their maintenance program and say, well, the next time a person comes in for a cleaning, we're gonna go ahead and do that. But not every practice has that opportunity and not every practice is necessarily expert at making that extra communication with the patient about the treatment that they need represented even in a recall appointment. Um, for specialty practices, there can be a component here that has to do with cooperative care, that you're actually sharing a patient in treatment uh, with another practice. And things can fall through the gaps when there's a series of appointments and a patient needs to go from practice to practice and then perhaps back to another practice. Things slow down, things get missed, things aren't shared as properly as they should be. So cooperative care is a big thing, um, as well as the communication with the patient. Who needs to be in touch with the patient? How frequently? regarding what subjects to make sure that they take their share of the responsibility in moving themselves through treatment and that this isn't just oriented to all of the work on the back of the practice. So this mechanism for closing the gaps in the practice has to do with looking at your systems, looking at your resources in terms of personnel. There's a lot of, uh, of tools that are oriented to your practice management software or even applications these days that are helping to keep you in communication with the right parts of your practice and your patients, but they need to be overseen and they need to be managed. We also have to evaluate how effective they're being and how much patients like them, how much the staff are actually using them. So this is a huge part of practice management and one that a manager needs to keep an eye on. Um, a lot of people who are a fully functioning office manager will tell us about this next part, which is the technology that's involved in a practice. Um, it can boil down very much to just troubleshooting, meaning something isn't working today and so we've got to get it sorted out on an emergency basis. However, um, the better approach to technology really has to do with evaluating your technological systems. Do you have the proper practice management software program for your practice running? A lot of people don't even want to ask that question, let alone, know, let alone know the answer or plan some kind of a transition if one is required. Um, but far from having to be a right now concept, moving forward on that idea, looking at it routinely, taking steps in the right direction, saving money for a transition that you might wanna get involved with, getting training, doing shopping, comparisons, even if this is just on the subject of updating within your own system, it requires an awful lot of time and attention and research and foresight. So this is something that we wanna get ahead of and not just be reactionary. Um, when it comes to your practice management software, there's a tremendous amount of reporting that's available. I think the national average is that we use 17% of what our practice management software is capable of doing, very similar number to what our cell phone can do based on what we actually use it for. Um, but having, it's not so much that we want to push a practice into using every single report that's available. That's not an important thing to do. It's important to know your software well enough to be able to find the reports that you need, run them, evaluate them, and then backfill. Oftentimes, you will find yourself faced with a part of data entry that needs to be optimized for the practice. This can occur at the front office when it comes to patient intake. It can occur in the back office when it has to do with charting. Um, it can have to do with the accounting side of things when it has to do with billing. But this reporting often leads you down the road of what kind of uh, practice optimization you need to get involved with for documentation. And somebody who doesn't have their nose in these reports and isn't seeing the common problems and pitfalls is not necessarily going to go back and optimize the other parts of the practice. So we also have the clinical side of technology, um, electronic medical records, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, electronic medical records and charting, uh, integration with some of your imaging machines and software, your billing processes being tied to your coding, 
uh, the integration of all of the above, this is an important thing for an office manager to have an eye for. Oftentimes, what ends up happening is you add technology or change technology within the practice. You show up and you need to get by with just that patient who's in front of you. The clinical staff or the front office staff will come up with a workaround for how they're going to handle just that one patient. It could be an extremely laborious system. It could be something that's inefficient or inappropriate, but we did it once. It worked, and you will find that that system will stay in place forever in the practice unless somebody takes a look at what the ideal protocol is and what the ideal process is and helps to make that a part of things moving forward. You know, your staff oftentimes need help to get through their day. They're not just complaining when they say that. And if you take a look at the minutes and in many, many cases, the hours that are being wasted on uh, inefficient technology and charting and reporting systems, this is a place where an office manager can be of tremendous help as it relates to improving the overall efficiency of a practice and the morale of the staff. It gets better outcomes for the patients. It keeps the doctor more tuned in to what he or she needs to be paying attention to during the day. So can't say enough about this important part of the office manager position. Um, quality control. This is a huge issue as well. It oftentimes boils down to who takes a phone call when an angry patient calls. That's fine, of course. Sometimes you, there's a misunderstanding with patient and we need to have a customer service call with them, something like that, and that's a great thing for an office manager to do. But again, this position and this presentation today is about getting proactive. So we wanna have an effective means of evaluating patient satisfaction for the good and the bad. And when we do get negative feedback about a patient experience, what are we doing with that information? Are we just saying, rejecting that information and saying, well, that patient was a difficult patient, it had special circumstances, that's an exception. Or are we really looking at patient feedback from the viewpoint, always, 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 of what we can do better? We're not gonna take every suggestion that a patient makes. They don't necessarily know the ins and outs of the practice's operations, but oftentimes there are ways of you seeing things through the patient's eyes. These things get normalized and um, just too familiar to often to practices oftentimes for them to keep objectivity. So we do have in this quality control area a means of regarding your patient satisfaction, but then taking the follow-up steps to do the things that make the changes that are required to improve your practice. Um, a lot of practices are working on patient reviews in your online presence. Um, this is represented in more than one part of your practice, both from a quality control point of view and also from a marketing point of view. You do have dissatisfied patients that require some communication. We do recommend that you do um, some surveys with your staff, and this all needs to be represented within the time that an office manager has to regard the best interest of the practice. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that in today's environment, you are working with affiliates oftentimes. This represents labs that you work with or practice enhan enhancements that you're dealing with, your website, um, perhaps a confirmation system that you're using, perhaps a billing system that you're using. And you do end up in the position of having to control or be responsible for the quality level of the affiliates that you're using. And sometimes the further away you are from control points having to do with those affiliates it becomes difficult and a little wobbly for you to be in charge of that. Well, that's where this regularity and oversight comes into play so that you can assure seamless and thorough and standardized outcomes for your patients, whether it's your practice doing it internally or some of your outsourcing affiliates that are involved with that care of your patients. So we mentioned here the reviews, and that's going to touch upon the next subject here, which is the marketing of your practice. Um, it's important for a practice to understand what's needed as it relates to the PR and the marketing efforts of uh, this team, this practice, this patient population, and your doctor population. When we're looking at assessing new volume, it's not just a matter of, hey, how many new patient appointments do we have on the schedule right now? Or if a new patient were to call in today, how long before they can get an appointment? That kind of thing. Of course, you need to know those things and you need to tend to those things. Patients who call you today and have to wait five weeks to get into your practice are going to go looking for someone else. But this is more like taking a look at 
what kind of new patient flow is required to move the practice forward. Uh, patients lose somewhere between, and this is for a general practice, somewhere between 8 and 10% of their practice population just by normal attrition. People die, they move, they change insurance, they have some sort of a problem with your practice and decide to move on. So when you're thinking about the amount of new patients that you need to get for your practice in the upcoming months and years, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that you have to be recruiting new patient flow in excess of your attrition in order for the practice to actually grow. Otherwise, it's just treading water if you're replacing just that 8 to 10% of new patients coming into the practice. So when we're taking a look at marketing, we do this assessment of what we need for new patient flow, and then we immediately start thinking about, well, how are we going to get it? We need to take a look at the personnel and the resources that are available to dedicate time, energy, effort to this activity and the regularity with which they can have um, working time, structured time, a set of responsibilities and actual training and help so that they can take care of these important tasks that have to do with marketing. Some practices are in a position where they hire a marketing person. Some practices outsource part of their marketing. But in any case, there is an in-practice, on-board presence required for some of the marketing that's involved. This is because practice marketing breaks down into an internal and an external component. You've got the idea that you've got these patients and these other practices that you work with that can send you a stream of referred patients to your business and that's important and needs to be tended to. It does not happen by itself. It is something that needs to be installed and overseen and worked on and you have to troubleshoot that. There's also your external marketing efforts. There are millions of ways that you can market a practice. A lot of people drift to what their online presence is. That's a great thing to include in your external marketing, but it's not the only thing involved with your external marketing. Your online presence has to do with your reputation management, uh, how widely you are seen and accessible and available to the public who are looking for you. Um, but it also has to do with your reviews, it has to do with your social media, things like that. We need to have, besides your patient referral program, besides your online presence, other external marketing activities that are represented in the way that you're going to generate new patient flow for your practice. Um, a huge part of understanding this very complicated subject, and we do have at ePractice Manager courses that are just dedicated to the subject of marketing, to what we're covering here today is the office manager's oversight of the marketing and the viability of the marketing for a practice. Um, at the heart of all of that is the statistics. What are we tracking to see whether or not we are properly assessing the needed new patient volume? Are we getting it? Are the steps that we're implementing moving us in the right direction or do we have some changes that need to be made? Um, a lot of this boils down to the personnel that are going to be involved, but a lot of it also boils down to the planning between the doctor and the office manager as far as which direction we're going to take things and if enough of that work is represented. So the next part of office manager performance has to do with special projects. Um, there are always special projects that need to be tended to in a practice. They do not fit in well with the day-to-day, minute-to-minute flow of your patients in your practice, but they do come into play. And it's difficult for a doctor to always understand the impact of going to an office manager and saying, hey, I'd like to have uh, digital forms and check-in for our patients, and I'd like to get that happening in the next month, not realizing that an office manager, in order to accomplish a project of that magnitude, something like, let's get a new website, or, hey, I want to move to another location, or there's just a million of these things, right? Um, not having an understanding of what the office manager would have to drop on day-to-day -day operations to get involved with a full-time special project, it's a real Achilles heel of a doctor-manager relationship and of a practice's overall stability. So when we take a look at special projects, we want to take a look at what functions is the office manager involved with? Understanding that some of those functions can't be dropped and neither can this new project. We don't suggest that a doctor who has this kind of an idea isn't on target with that needing to be done, but we have to take a look at how it fits in with things. 
This gives us an opportunity to prioritize both our normal workflow and the projects that are being thrown at the office manager position, but also for the office manager to perhaps delegate part of the research or part of the legwork that can be done on a project to other staff members who may have time within their own position. Um, the most important thing having to do with special projects, and one of the first things an office manager should do faced with this type of a scenario, is to create a timeline and handle the expectation management appropriately and say to a doctor, I've got an hour a day or five hours a week to work on something like this without affecting my other work. Um, at that pace, it looks like it's going to take about three weeks to get this project done. I've got some information here about pricing, so we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for it. There's an awful lot that can get on track and stay on track as it relates to special projects from the office manager position if we simply stop and take a moment to understand with the timeline and the expectations that are involved and communicate that clearly with the doctor. Sometimes it changes the priorities. Sometimes the doctor will say, it's actually more vital than this in my opinion. I'd like to get some of your other functions on the day-to-day -day stuff within the office handled so that you can dedicate more time to this or I'm going to decide to bring somebody from the outside to lend a hand with forwarding this project. So these are all important ways to think about and uh, work within the special project format. It's a, one of the things that once you get an office manager into the position and functioning properly, this can cause a distraction or throw somebody off base or destabilize the area more than anything else. So instead of being prone to that, we just build time and an understanding of the subject into the office manager position and allow for it because it simply will come up. And oftentimes these are things that nobody else really can do. So the next part of the office manager position, um, this is a little bit of a catch-all type of subject or, or category here, but you know there are other things that come up both at regular intervals and sometimes even on a surprise basis that have to do with functions that don't really go anywhere else in a practice. Um, oftentimes these are largely doctor or owner responsibilities, but it's absolutely um, not reasonable to expect that a doctor is going to have the time to devote to this during a busy patient schedule. So taking these important subjects, these other executive responsibilities, and really making a clear determination of how much of this is going to be worn and owned by the doctor and how much of it is going to be handled by the office manager, that's an important step to take right from the get-go when you're setting up the office manager position and you're comparing it to the ideal operation of an office manager position. So this includes things like your physical site, your location, um, any legal needs that you have, financial needs that you have, not just limited to taxes, but some of the other financial intersection points that may fall between the practice and other parts of your working operations. Um, obviously, we always have some sort of component of continuing education, licensing, certification, credentialing, things like that. Um, this can be calendarized and you can understand what's gonna to have to be regarded when, but you can also backfill that if you know that you have uh, counting practices that are gonna come due by the end of the year, then you want to start working on them a little bit earlier, same thing with credentialing. An office manager having a calendar that addresses the practice fundamentals, the rudimentary subjects that um, are involved with keeping the practice basics and fundamentals in place. That's an important thing. And uh, just managing the calendar and getting ahead of some of these important things. You can't turn your page of your calendar and find out that you've got a lease that expires in a month and that you're going to have to move or renew and not have had any time to plan and get some more research and data done on that ahead of time. Um, clearly, there are other important issues such as your, his, your HIPAA and your OSHA compliance, but there are others. You know, you are subject to board regulations and regional statutes that come into play for your own practice in your own area, um, keeping an eye on the changes as it relates to human resource changes, laws, regulations, statutes, procedures, things like that, 
somebody's got to have an eye for this. Um, we often accomplish some of that through regular training classes. Um, E-Practice Manager does offer training on these subjects, but you will find that the employment division in your state oftentimes will offer a summary course that will keep an office manager in touch with the different parts of things that you need to do. Perhaps your local association um, and others can help you with this kind of thing. So I hope that we've taken an opportunity today to cover some of the basic parts of the office manager position and let you know what's involved with this vital part of the executive structure of a practice. Again, one of the biggest problems being that it is underestimated, it is undervalued, it is misunderstood, and we wanna paint this picture so that both a doctor and an office manager can understand all the component parts of the practice and of the office manager's position, how those things intersect, how they work with the doctor to move the practice forward. If you have any questions about this or if you would like an evaluation of your own office manager position done or maybe a progress program to see how you can move the office manager position in your practice closer to more of an ideal format for your needs, um, you have my contact information on the screen. Please let me know and I'd be happy to help with that. Um, I think that that's it. I appreciate the time to go over this today and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks.